Selamat sore teman-teman, rekan-rekan semua. Terima kasih sudah bergabung di dalam acara uh, webinar Uber Mission and Theology dari, uh, yang diselenggarakan oleh ST Bandung ini. ya. Jadi, seperti tadi disampaikan dalam video, acara ini merupakan rangkaian dari acara Urban Mission Consultation yang nanti puncaknya di bulan Agustus. Jadi, tujuan dari acara ini secara keseluruhan adalah untuk memobilisasi sebenarnya gereja uh, untuk bersama-sama kita akan memikirkan keterlibatan orang percaya, keterlibatan gereja terhadap kesejahteraan kota. Nah, supaya gereja tidak hanya memikirkan diri sendiri, tapi kita bersama-sama bermisi dalam konteks perkotaan. Barangkali selama ini kalau bicara misi, kita bicara misi di UPG, gitu ya, daerah yang tertinggal. Tetapi bagaimana dengan kota? Nah, inilah kita akan gemuli bersama selama beberapa bulan ini dalam rangkaian-rangkaian acara yang sudah dirancang sedemikian rupa. Jadi setelah ini nanti juga akan ada Youth Fest, ya Pak Romi ya. Ada Youth Fest dan juga nanti puncaknya di bulan Agustus. Sekali lagi terima kasih untuk para peserta yang sudah bergabung. Terima kasih juga untuk para pemakalah yang sudah bersedia memberikan kontribusi pemikirannya, yang akan kita bisa nikmati bersama sore hari ini dan juga besok. Juga para volunteer dan moderator, terima kasih untuk partisipasinya. Tuhan Yesus memberkati. Ya, selamat sore Bapak-Ibu. Selamat datang, selamat hadir di dalam webinar kita pada malam hari ini. Uh, hari ini kita akan dirayani ada dua pembicara utama, yaitu Bapak Christopher Wright dan Bapak Johan Setiawan. Halo Chris, halo Pak Johan. Uh, we are so delighted. Yeah. Uh, we are so hello. delighted to yeah, have you. I'm here. Us. I'm just there. Yeah, there we go. I'm just starting my video again. Okay. Well, hello. Hi everybody. Hello, hello. Yeah. yeah. We are so delighted to have you among us, Chris. Pembicara you, kita yes. yang pertama adalah uh, Chris. Beliau adalah seorang misiologis dan juga seorang ahli perjanjian lama. Dan beliau adalah rohaniawan di Gereja Anglikan. Saat ini menjabat sebagai Global Ambassador dan Director dari International Ministry dari Langham Partnership International. Topik yang akan dibawakan adalah Sense in the Marketplace. Setelah Chris selesai dengan sesinya, kemudian akan dilanjutkan dengan pembicara kedua, yaitu Bapak Johan Setiawan, dengan topik Discipleship in Urban Marketplace Context. Bapak Johan memiliki pengalaman dalam dunia pemuritan lebih dari 30 dekade. Sekarang beliau menjabat sebagai ketua lead center dan dosen tentang pemuritan di SETB. Nah, kita akan mulai dengan sesi yang akan dipandu oleh Christopher Wright dengan topik Sense in the marketplace. Hello, my name is Chris Wright, and our topic today is what I've called Saints in the Public Square. Let me just share my screen so we can see that. Uh, there are various terms actually for what we're talking about in this lecture uh, the marketplace, the workplace, the secular world, the public arena, and so on. I'm just calling it, for the moment, the public square, by which I mean the whole world of human work, trade, professions, law, government, education, industry, the arts, the sciences, etc. Wherever human beings uh, engage together to get things done. The Old Testament word for this actually was the gate. Uh, and the question really is, is God interested in that? Many Christians seem to operate on the everyday assumption that God is not really interested in the public world or the so-called secular world. Or at least they presume that God is interested in the workplace only as a place for potential evangelism. God, it would seem on this opinion, God cares about the church and about its affairs and about getting people to heaven, but not about how society and its public places are conducted here on earth. Here we go. God and the public square. First of all, God created it. You see, work is God's idea. Genesis 1 and 2 give us our first picture of the God of the Bible. And it presents God to us. God presents himself to us as a worker. There he is, thinking, choosing, planning, executing, and evaluating something that he does and accomplishes. God works. So when God decides to create humankind in the image and likeness of God, 
what else could humans be but workers reflecting in their working lives something of the nature of God himself. And specifically, God laid upon human beings the task of ruling the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and of serving and keeping it in Genesis chapter 2. So the biblical witness is then that all of this human endeavor, all of this human work is part of God's intention for human life on earth. Work matters because God made us workers by God himself created in his image. So then uh, to come back to our screen, we move on to a second thing here that the Bible teaches us about God in the public square and the world of work, and that is that God audits it. Now, I think we're probably all fairly familiar with the function of an auditor. The auditor provides independent, impartial, and objective scrutiny of a company or a charity's activities and claims. He is the independent judge of all that goes on in the public square, in the arena of human social life. The Old Testament speaks repeatedly of Yahweh, the God of Israel, as the God who sees and knows and evaluates. And this is true uh, in a most universal sense of every individual. Here again, as we move back to our screen, you take a, a place like Psalm 33, where we read that from heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on the earth. He forms the hearts of all and he considers everything they do. That's an auditing function. But it's specifically the public square that Israel was repeatedly reminded that that's where God calls for justice. Justice in the gate as the prophets would say, that is in the public square, the marketplace, the court, for example, in Amos chapter five, where God says, I know how many are your offenses and how great are your sins. You oppress the righteous and you take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. But says God, you need to hate evil and love good and maintain justice in the courts. And furthermore, God hears the kind of talk that goes on in the underhand, secret, greedy world of some kinds of business practices and trading. Here's Amos chapter eight, where God says, hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? And when will the Sabbath be ended that we can market our wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. But the Lord says, I will never forget what they have done. God is the auditor. He sees, he hears, he knows. And for those who think that God is confined to the temple and the temple courts uh, in the Old Testament or the church, as we might say today, and sees only what is going on there in religious observance, Jeremiah brings something of a shock, uh, that God is also watching what goes on in the rest of the week in the public sphere. So yes, God is the auditor, the independent inspector of all that happens in the public arena. And what he therefore demands, as auditors should, is complete transparency, integrity. In what way does your accountability to God, not just to your boss, affect the way you do your work? Do you see yourself as working for God and before God in his presence, day by day, at the desk, in the place of work, wherever it is that God is the auditor? So the world of work, God created it, God audits it. Now here's a, a third perspective that the Bible brings uh, to the uh, public awareness, the public arena. And that is that God governs it and judges it. Now, we know, of course, that human public life, the marketplace, or just the market, as it's sometimes called, is made up of human choices for which human beings are accountable and responsible. And yet, at the same time, the Bible puts it all under God's sovereign government. See, the Bible affirms both sides of this paragraph, of this paradox. 
And there are many Bible stories that, that illustrate this. Uh, here, here, here are some. Let me go back uh, to our slides here. There's the story of Joseph. Familiar story there in Genesis, which moves from family life and then into the public arena in Egypt at the highest level of state power in relation to political and agricultural and economic and even foreign affairs. And in those narratives, all the human actors are personally morally responsible for their own motives and words and actions, whether good or evil. But the words of Joseph to his brothers at the very end of the story and the end of the book of Genesis express God's view of all that had been happening through that long story. We read there in Genesis 50 that Joseph said to them, don't be afraid, am I in place of God? And then he says, you, you, my brothers, you intended to harm me. Literally, it is you meant it for evil, he says. He's not making any excuses for them. They chose to do what they did to sell him into slavery and everything else. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So it's, it's significant then that when the prophets turn their attention to the great empires of their day, they affirm God's government just as much over those other nations and empires as over his own covenant people, Israel. And that includes their public works, the marketplace, just as much as, as the military and all their adventures in conquering others. So, for example, um, Isaiah chapter 19 puts the whole of Egypt under God's judgment, including its religion, its uh, irrigation project, its agriculture, its fisheries, its textile industry, its politicians, its universities. It's all, as it were, under the governing judgment of God. Or you look at Ezekiel chapter 26 and 28, that's a sustained lament for the great seaport city of Tyre, when God's judgment would fall on them for their domination of the maritime trade routes that stretched right across the Mediterranean. So they're portrayed as a great trading ship filled with the cargoes of the nations, which God sinks in the depths of the sea to great fear, trembling. And so that's why you see, at the end of the great Bible narrative in the book of Revelation, uh, in Revelation chapter 18, Babylon becomes the code name for the whole global economic political system. And, and it portrays God as the ultimate judge on its greed and injustice and cruel oppression that causes so much human suffering. And so that means therefore that I think the third question that we have to ask of those who are seeking to follow Jesus in the so-called secular workplace and marketplace out there in the public square is, where and how do you perceive the governance of God in the marketplace, seeing God as the one who's in charge? What does it mean in that sense to do as Jesus said and to seek first the kingdom of God, the sovereignty of God, the rule of God, and his justice. And what difference does it make when you do? Is it simply the case that heaven rules, to quote Daniel, on Sundays, but the market rules from Monday to Friday? And Saturday's a kind of day off for everybody. And so we turn then to our fourth perspective uh, on the whole biblical world of work. And it's a glorious surprise, and that is that God redeems it. And that, I hope, may come as something of a surprise. Because a pretty common Christian assumption that many people make is that everything that happens here on earth is nothing more than temporary and transient and really has nothing to do with God or eternity. Life here is, is just a kind of vestibule, a kind of entrance lobby. For eternity. So it doesn't really matter very much. It, it, it just, we don't need to bother about it too much. That's what many Christians think. And that very negative view of life on the earth, I think, is, is partly drawn from a mistaken interpretation of the language of 2 Peter chapter 3, where we, it talks about the 
apparent obliteration, the destruction of the whole earth and indeed of all the physical creations, creation. And if that's where it's all headed, you know, it's all just going to be burnt up, uh, then what eternal value can there possibly be to the work that we do in the here and now in this world? But the point I would want to make here is this, coming back to our, our screen, that that passage there in 2 Peter 3 is really talking about the destruction of the evil world of human sin, the, the cleansing of the earth from the ungodly. Just as in the first half of the chapter, Peter talks about the, the destruction of the wicked in the flood, Noah's flood, when the world, world was destroyed, he uses that word, by water. And in the same way, he says, it will be destroyed by fire. He's using the symbolism of fire uh, as a cleansing metaphor, purging, not a total obliteration, but the cleansing and purging of the earth. So you see, this is the, this is the very different perspective that the Bible presents on this, that God plans ultimately to redeem all that he has made. Because as Psalm 145 tells us, God loves all that he has made and included within all that God has made is all that we have made with what God has made or what God has given to us as as it were our use of creation our enhancement and development of creation in the great cultural mandate of our civilizations now, of course of course we know that all that we human beings have done on this earth has been tainted twisted spoiled by our sinful, fallen human nature. We are sinners. And just as we need to be cleansed and purified by God, so also do all our works. But you see, that's exactly the picture that we have in both the Old and the New Testament. It's a vision of redemption, not obliteration, of cleansing and restoration of all that is good and valuable in God's creation and in what we have done with it. There's a wonderful passage in Isaiah 65, which expresses this, that's particularly verses 17 to 25, where we have this glorious portrayal of what God says, I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth, a whole new creation, says God. And it looks forward to human life in this new creation that will be long, no longer will be subject to weariness and decay and death, in which there will be the fulfillment of family life and working life, in which all the curses of frustration and injustice and unfairness will be gone forever, in which there will be close, joyful fellowship with God, and also, indeed, in which there will be environmental harmony and safety within the animal and vegetable creation. The whole of human life, private life, family life, public life, will be redeemed and restored by God to glorifying productiveness. Paul is speaking about the whole creation when in Colossians chapter 1, he talks five times about all things in heaven and on earth. And he says that this totality, this creational totality of, of the heavens and the earth has not only been created by Christ and for Christ and is being sustained by Christ, but it's also redeemed by Christ through the blood of his cross. That's there in that incredible passage, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And because of this plan of redemption that God has for the whole of creation and for ourselves, it means that we look forward to the redemption of ourselves and creation together. As Paul puts it in Romans 8, that the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. But the creation was subjected to frustration, yes, of course, because of our sin and evil, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope, that is, in the certainty that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And that's why, therefore, the final vision of the Bible, there in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, is not of us escaping from the earth to go to some other place up in heaven, but rather of God coming down to live with us again in a cleansed and restored creation from which all evil will have been purged. And John describes that new creation as the city of God, doesn't he? 
and, and he sees all the glory of human civilization cleansed and purified of all evil being brought into the city of God. Here's what he says in Revelation 21, verses 24 to 27. The nations will walk by its light, that is, the light of Christ himself in the city of God. And the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there'll be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, those words, splendor, glory, honor of kings and nations, uh, must mean that the combined product of generations of human beings whose lives and effort and work have generated this vast store of human culture and civilization. In other words, what will be brought into the city of God in the new creation, I think what these verses are telling us, will be this vast accumulated output of human work through the ages, all, of course, purged of evil, restored, redeemed, and then laid at the feet of Christ in order to enhance the life of eternity in God's new creation. Now, God's plan ultimately is its redemption, purging and restoration. And I wonder, doesn't that, doesn't that transform uh, our whole attitude and perspective to Monday mornings when we go to the world of our work? So what this is saying is that all human history that, that takes place within the marketplace of public human interaction will be redeemed and purged and in some sense fulfilled in the new creation, not just abandoned and destroyed, which means that all our human work has value. It has significance, not just because of our role within creation from the beginning, when God told us to do this stuff, to be rulers and servants of creation, but also because of the new creation and the eschatological hope that it sets before us. And so with, with such a hope, then we can heartily follow Paul's exhortation. Do you remember it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he's talked all about the resurrection of Jesus and how important that is, and where he says, therefore, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord, that is in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, is not in vain. Knowing that the work we do for the Lord isn't just religious work, so to speak, but any work that is done as unto the Lord, which includes even the manual labor of slaves, as Paul would tell them in Colossians and Ephesians. So then, what have we seen? We've seen God's view, God's view of the public square, the social world of work, of economics, of politics, of government. And according to the Bible, God created it, he audits it, he governs and judges it, and he will ultimately redeem it. So that leads us on then uh, to thinking now about, well, then what ought to be the attitude and the role and the mission of God's people in that sphere? And here I've got two things that I want to say that, first of all, we are called to engagement, but at the same time, we are called to distinctiveness. Those two things, engagement and distinctiveness. Let's think of each of them in turn. First of all, we are called to engagement. And how can we be doing that? Well, first of all, it can very simply be done by actually serving the state, by actually engaging in public or political or civic office. The Old Testament, as we've seen, contains quite notable examples of believers, that is, believers in the God of Israel, uh, who were engaged in the public arena in the service, as we saw, of pagan empires and powers, like Joseph and Daniel. But, you know, the New Testament also urges Christians to be good citizens, good workers, paying our taxes, uh, and so on. And one example of this, actually, in the New Testament is Erastus, who you may or may not have heard of, uh, because he only gets referred to twice. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 22, he's one of Paul's companions, 
So for part of his time, he was traveling with Paul. But then at the end of Romans, we read that Erastus had become the director of public works for the city of Corinth, which was actually a very responsible and pretty senior civic role major responsibilities to make sure that the food supply was there, the water supply was there to keep peace and law and order and so on. And there's Erastus, a Christian believer, serving Corinth, a Roman city of that time. So we can serve in the public arena. A second way, of course, that we can engage publicly is by praying for and seeking the welfare of the city. Now those words as you probably know, come from Jeremiah's letter to the exiles in Babylon, in Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, where in verse 7 he says, Also seek the welfare of the city where I have put you, and pray to the Lord for it. Now that's, <laughs> that's a pretty astonishing instruction, because remember, those people of Judah were exiles in the land of an enemy who had destroyed their city and their temple, and had dragged them a thousand miles away from home. They, they were prisoners of war. They were captives in Babylon. And yet Jeremiah says, yeah, well, seek the welfare of that city. Pray for that city. God tells them, you see, to, to remember their calling as the children of Abraham. They were to be a blessing to all nations, even their enemies, in the way they lived and prayed and worked and simply cared for the welfare of the people who were around them. And then, thirdly, of course, another way in which we engage in the public square is one that's open to anybody, in fact, probably most of you, is that we can do it by ordinary, honest, everyday work. It seems that uh, in some of the churches that Paul knew, particularly the one that he very early had founded in Thessalonica, but some people were thinking, you see, that ordinary work was no longer really any value. And they became lazy. And, and then they spiritualized their idleness with saying, well, you know, Jesus is coming back soon, so we can just give up our jobs. We don't need to work anymore. Well, Paul agreed with them, of course, about Christ's return. But he didn't approve of that kind of attitude, that they were just opting out of normal human responsibilities and work and becoming idle and lazy. No, he says, and here's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, no, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands, just as we did and as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and that you will not be dependent on anybody. And of course, Paul could appeal to his own example as one who had supported himself uh, through his own labor. He worked for his living in the secular workplace as a tent maker. As he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And we did this, he adds, in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. So you see, Paul insists then that in serving others in society by working, we are also serving God. In fact, even to Christian slaves who would be working for non-Christian pagan masters who might be very cruel, Paul can say to them, you know, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Here's something that John Stott said about this, which I think is rather well said. I think I've had that up already. Yes, here it is. Here's what John Stott says. It's in his book, The Contemporary Christian. He says, it is a wonderful thing to be a missionary or a pastor if God calls us to it. But it is equally wonderful to be a Christian lawyer, industrialist, politician, manager, social worker, television script writer, journalist or homemaker, if God calls us to it. According to Romans 13 verse 4, an official of the state, whether legislator, magistrate, policeman or policewoman, is just as much a minister of God, diakonos theu, as a pastor. There is a crying need, says John Stott, for Christian men and women who see their daily work as their primary Christian ministry 
and who determine to penetrate their secular environment for Christ. But if we are to penetrate that secular environment, the public square, the workplace for Christ, then we need something more than just engagement with it, which is what we've been talking about. We are also called to distinctiveness. So we're to be engaged, yes, but we're to be engaged as Christians, as saints in the marketplace, because we are called to be holy, which basically means to be different, to be distinctive. This calling on distinctiveness, this moral distinctiveness to start with, was actually an essential part of the faith of Old Testament Israel. We are called to live by different standards. And that, I think, is what Jesus means when he talks about how his followers, his disciples, are salt, salt of the earth and the light of the world, he says in Matthew chapter 5. And those give us some crucial insights into what it means to belong to Jesus in the public arena. Because those two metaphors, salt and light, they combine to remind us, don't they, that the world around us is both corrupt and dark. You see, as Christians, we are living in the Bible story. And it's that great Bible story which sees the whole of human life, work, ambitions, achievements, all of them valid in their own way, all of them intended by God to be part of his creation and what we do and his redemption and his future plans. But we see all of that, all our work, in the context of the overarching biblical story of God's creation through to new creation. But I want to finish. And I want to finish with a word to any of you who may be pastors or church leaders in some way. And I want to urge you to accept that part of the function of the church, and especially of pastors, is to support those who live their lives daily as saints in this public arena, out there in the world. You see, Paul tells us, doesn't he, that God has given his church pastors and teachers to equip God's people for works of service, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. And I believe that that phrase, works of service, doesn't just mean Christian activities within the church, but all and any form of service that we may do as Christian believers in society and in the church. So this, this Ephesians 4, it turns right upside down one of the commonest misconceptions that still permeates many churches. Because, believe it or not, God did not invent the church to support the clergy. <laughs> Rather, God gave pastors and teachers to the church in order to equip the saints, God's people. People don't go to church on Sunday to support their pastor in his ministry. It's the other way around. The pastor goes to church on Sunday to support his people in their ministry, which is outside the church, out there in the world, being salt and light in the public square. And so the challenge then to pastors is, are you helping ordinary working Christians to understand the world they live in? Or are you just dangling before them every Sunday the prospect of a better world when we all get to heaven or something like that? Are you providing biblical teaching, a biblical worldview for working Christians in their lives and their witness? Are you helping Christians to wrestle with those ethical issues, those conscience issues that they struggle with in the workplace, encouraging them to be faithful and to be men and women of integrity and courage and perseverance? Well, in order to do that, if that's what you should be doing, then, of course, it means that pastors and teachers in the church need to know those problems for themselves and not just live in some kind of spiritual or ecclesiastical bubble. Well, as I finish, I have to say that on this particular topic, I feel rather like a coward because my own working life uh, has mostly been spent not in the secular marketplace of the world, I did have a few years as a school teacher, and then I moved into the professional world of pastoral ministry and theological education. But I do have a, a great admiration and indeed a great concern for all of you Christians who do engage every day of your working lives 
in the workplaces of the world because you are the Daniels of this world, or at least you can be and you should be. You are the salt of the earth, as Jesus calls you. You are the, the light of the world. And what would it be like if all the millions of Christians who do earn their living in the secular workplace around the world were to take seriously what Jesus meant by being salt and light in the world? You see, your work matters because it matters to God, our creator and our redeemer. And what you do has got some place in God's plans for the new creation. So if you do it conscientiously, if you do it as a disciple of Jesus, willing to bear witness to him and if necessary to suffer for him, then he will enable you and your life to bear fruit in multiplying the citizens new creation from among your friends and your working colleagues and so may god bless you